Hello, this is part 11 of the Chris Watts Prison Interview Analysis. And to give you a warning, this is probably the darkest part in the entire series. So if you feel that you're too sensitive for some of the more disturbing details of the case, you might just want to skip ahead and wait for part 12 when we wrap up the series as a whole. But if you think you can handle it, let's make some sense out of the nonsense and pull some truths out of those disturbing lies. We're picking up where Chris and everyone gets back from lunch. And this is the final act of the play they're all performing, where Graham and Tammy and Bomb over just throw everything at Chris and don't care so much whether or not he walks out because they've pretty much hit the wall anyway. They're staying his friend and staying in character, but a little more aggressive now. They're applying the pressure. Graham sets the tone to try to get helper Chris by saying, we need to get into the mechanics of everything to help us for talking to people in the future so we can say, well, this isn't a monster. This is more like a Chris Watts. And in the words of Shanann's dad, an evil monster. So helper Chris shows up, but he's only helping himself because Graham and Tammy and Baumover are asking them questions like kind of like lawyers, they know what the answer is based on all the evidence they collected in their investigation, and they just want him to admit it. They don't know everything. They have like a rough sketch, and they just want him to color it in for them. And he will color it in, but the wrong colors, because his answers, filling in their blanks, is just to get sympathy for himself. Helper Chris wants to help himself. And we can see an example of that by not so much the details he's telling, but what details he's leaving out, such as when Tammy asks for more about what Shanann looked like when he was killing her. She says, I remember you talking about mascara tears running down her face. Did you notice her eyes filling with blood at all? Just to get more details, to get the more Chris reveals, even if it's not true, the more truth we can find. That's the goal here with the whole prison interview. And Chris says he doesn't really, he didn't really notice the bloodshot eyes until he got later on, throw her, he threw her in the shallow grave. And then he says he noticed the bloodshot eyes then. But that contradicts his letter to Cheryl Cadle, where he describes as he's murdering her, her eyes filled with blood as she looked at me and she died. Now, what's missing from all of these contradictory accounts that Chris tells of murdering Shanann is... How much light was actually in the room? Because we know from neighbor Nate's security camera footage that it was already over before the sun even came up that day. So was it pitch black in the room when Chris committed the crime? Was a nightlight just barely illuminating some things? Did he turn on the full light so he could see everything? I have a feeling from everything we've heard of Chris that he left the lights off and... By the way he's described over and over again, he either climbed into bed or crawled into bed or slipped back into bed, that he kind of just felt his way around through the darkness for the one body part that he was looking for that was more interesting to him than any emotional conversation. So he's leaving out these details that would make it harder to get sympathy for himself because that's really his goal and he's being a helper just to get sympathy for himself and comply to get approval. But these attempts for sympathy will sometimes backfire since he doesn't share the empathy that his audience has. So he'll say something thinking it's going to make them feel sorry for him and it actually makes them feel sorry for his victims. And then he has to backpedal. And that comes up when we get into them questioning whether or not Bella and Celeste were really alive on the drive from his house to survey 319 where he disposed of the bodies. And the reason he says they were alive is because um, he hears every day Bella saying, Daddy, no, at survey 319. And he also remembers her saying, Daddy, it smells on the drive there. And um, Graham shows that they actually were feeling sympathy for his victims when he says, so that goes back to Shanann evacuating himself. And Chris backpedals there and realizes, oh, I'm describing my three and four-year-old daughters sitting on top of their mother's dead decomposing body. Whoops, that doesn't make me look very good. So he backpedals and says, oh, no, I think it was actually a skunk. Nice try, Chris. 
So Chris, at this point, is starting to feel the pressure, and I think he's having flashbacks to the end of the interrogation where they pressured him into eventually confessing to murdering Shanann, which was his downfall. And I think that because the Chris Watts rule comes back into effect where he replies in the negative to everything and the opposite is always true. So there's a lot of, as we've already covered, I wasn't thinking, I don't know what was going on, don't know what was going through my head. And possibly the least honest and most evasive answer he gives is when they ask, when he got to Survey 319 and took Shanann's body out of the truck with Bella and Celeste still alive in the back of the truck, Graham says, is that when you buried her? And Chris never even really answers that question. Instead, he den he denies something else entirely. He says, I don't know if I dug the hole first or if I, but no, they didn't watch me do that. So instead of saying yes or no to whether or not he buried her next, he denies that the girls watched him dig the hole, which wasn't asked of him. Which leads me to believe that he possibly dug it Friday with, when he had the girls to himself with Shanann out of town. That they watched him dig the hole that he was going to put their mother in on Monday. But perhaps the most disgusting example of the Chris Watts rule in this entire prison interview is when the topic of Bella's last words comes up after Chris murdered Celeste right next to Bella and then... Bella watches Chris put Celeste in one of the oil tanks. When Chris goes back to Bella in the truck, Chris tells how Bella says, is the same thing that happened to Cece going to happen to me? By the way, I said everything that there was to say about Chris denying that Bella and Celeste knew what was going on at the end of part seven in this series. But obviously I wasn't the only one who noticed it because at this point in the prison interview, Chris has just been adding that detail that they didn't know what was going on to everything he tells. So they were just walking around the house. They didn't know what was going on. They were just sitting quiet in the back seat. They didn't know what was going on. Bella was just sitting there next to Celeste. She didn't know what was going on. But then he gives himself away by having Bella say, is the same thing that happened to Cece going to happen to me? Because Graham says, instead of saying everything that I said about Chris, he defends Bella by saying, so Bella's pretty smart. And I'm sure he leaves out a few curse words and insults that he wanted to get in, but he's got to stay in character. So Chris goes for sympathy again and utilizes the Chris Watts rule by saying, I don't know if I said yes to her like a horrible person or if I just put the blanket over her head and did the same thing to her. Well, why would that even occur to you unless you were riding high on your actions? Why would it occur to you to say yes from what we know of Chris and the Chris Watts rule, I have a feeling he said no and then did it because every other tale of his that he, about what took place during this whole time is him denying that he was executing his master plan to anyone he was talking to while actually executing his master plan. So I have a feeling he just said no, giggled, and then did it. And the reason I think he enjoyed doing this is because... Graham asks of Bella's last words, how did she sound when she said that to you, Chris? And Chris laughs as he says, it's soft voice she always had. Now, we can all have moments of dark humor. We can laugh at things that we ordinarily wouldn't laugh at if we're disconnected from the reality of the situation and have no real emotional attachment to it. And that's how Chris can laugh at this revelation. That he juxtaposes her soft, innocent, four-year-old girl voice with the mortal terror of her statement. He can laugh at that contradiction and that juxtaposition because he has no emotional attachment to what she was going through. So he can just have a moment of dark humor there because he never really felt any emotion for them other than at this point he's just feeling as he said in other times rage and anger for the fact that they were still alive they were distracting him into forgetting things so that his plan was getting messed up and wasn't as quick and clean as he originally intended it to be but now he's final step in his plan is to get rid of Bella and then then he's scot-free 
So he enjoyed that, and he says as little as possible about the crimes, but then enthusiastically goes into excruciating detail about the problem at Survey 319 that he possibly started himself and was his excuse to go there alone Monday morning. He will say, and this took place, what, a half hour where he was, he finished up murdering and disposing of the bodies, and then he went back to the reason he was at Survey 319 in the first place, taking care of whatever the leak was at the bottom of the tank. And he just goes into excruciating detail about, oh, I got the box rubbers, and I dug the hole, and I pressure tested the line, and then I filled up the hole, and then I pressure tested it again, and I had to downgrade on the box rubbers, and the blah, 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 blah. And this took place minutes after he didn't know what was going on or what was said. It had no concept of time. I believe that's re referred to as selective memory or known colloquially as bullshit. And by the way, on the subject of having no concept of time, when they ask how long did it take to strangle Bella and Celeste, he says, I had no concept of time at this point. His phone activity shows that he was extremely aware of the concept of time and of every single minute that was passing and of where exactly all of his co-workers were and when they would be there. Because every minute he was texting someone, calling someone, seeing a new text come in, where are you at, when are you going to be here, this is what I'm doing here right now. Nothing about the fact that he has Shanann and Bella and Celeste with him. But he's very aware, based on his phone activity, of every single minute that's passing. And then there is about a 45-minute gap in his phone activity where he finished murdering and disposing of the bodies. And then, to break that 45-minute silence, where he cleaned up his master plan and then got back to his excuse for why he was at Survey 319 in the first place, when his co-worker or manager or whoever it was asked him how was the problem going at Survey 319, Chris replies with one word. Fresh. His wife and kids are gone, the bodies are out of sight, and he's feeling fresh. And I think he even threw an LOL in there, too. Really sounds like a remorseful guy who wishes he could take it back and can't even describe the amount of love he has for his wife and girls. So, appropriately enough, Graham, once again, he's letting some of his true feelings out, but in a friendly way, not quite showing his hand, he says, so what do you think of yourself now, Chris? In other words, how do you live with yourself? How do you look at your reflection in the toilet water that you sleep next to every night? And Chris goes into his favorite subject now, which is judgment. And he says how he used to judge criminals on TV, but now that he's the guy who's the criminal in the jumpsuit, he doesn't judge people anymore. Well, that makes sense. That makes it more sense than most of the things Chris says, because he used to judge people for getting caught for their crimes, because up until he got in trouble, in his words, he had never got caught. So he could put himself above all the other criminals and judge them like, yeah, you got caught. You're an idiot, but I won't get caught. And we know that because he words it that way. He said, before I got in trouble, I was always the guy that was helping everybody, which is the act. He's describing his act and not his actual actions. Because it's not before I committed murder, I was always the guy that was helping people. It's before I got in trouble, I was always the guy that was helping people. That's the key element to him, is whether or not he got caught for it, not what he did. So... In the midst of all these horrible revelations and disturbing details, Graham actually says, One of the funniest things that a human being has ever uttered, but it gets lost in the horror of the situation, so I don't think anyone laughs, but if you could look at it just in a vacuum, it's actually hilarious. Because after everything Chris has revealed and the way he reveals it to try to protect himself and downplay the horror of what his victims are going through and trying to make them look bad and himself look better, Graham tries to butter Chris up by saying, Chris, you care deeply about others. And in the related story, by the way, the sun is cold and the touch of a feather to a cotton ball will cause a sound that shatters glass. But Graham is just saying this, what might be the biggest lie, and in a room with Chris Watts talking for four and a half hours, imagine the territory that covers that Graham would say the biggest lie. You care deeply about others. It's meant to butter Chris up. 
because they need to hear him say that he really did murder his daughters. Because Tammy, in the later interview, Tammy will say, I need to hear it from Chris's own measly little lips that he was the one, not Shanann, who murdered Bella and Celeste. And he does. There's this chance to take it back and say, well, no, I was, I care deeply about others, and I was just trying to protect Shanann's memory. It was really her. But he doesn't. He admits that he really did it. And then he goes back into, hopefully everyone can stop judging everybody. That's his new favorite topic is nobody should judge anybody. And imagine what a wonderful world that would be where nobody judges anybody for anything they've done. And everyone just lives in a blissful, harmonious world free of judgment. Why, imagine how the sentencing hearing would have gone in this fantasy world where everyone is free of judgment. You know, the judge could have been up there on the stand saying, Mr. Watts, in my 17 years on the bench, this is objectively the most inhumane and vicious crime that I have ever handled out of the thousands of cases that I have seen. Da, I don't judge you, Chris. Deputies, I respectfully ask that you take off his handcuffs, give him back his North Carolina t-shirt, give him back his flip-flops, take him right to his mistress. We don't judge him. We're free of judgment in this perfect world. Have a nice time with your mistress, Chris. Oh, what a wonderful world that would be where everyone can stop judging everybody. Is that really the truth? Yeah, I don't think so, Chris. I don't think so. So, we got one more part in this to wrap up our analysis of the prison interview of Chris Watts. And we're going to get to Graham delivering the parting shot of all parting shots at the end of that that I don't think anyone else has even noticed. But I believe that Chris noticed, and I believe that this line that Graham says, will follow Chris down to the eternal halls of hell and haunt him forevermore. But we'll get to that in part 12. So I'll see you then. <laughs>